Goodness gracious, it's the Christmas season. There's no denying it. Is everybody ready for Christmas? No. No. That's the question of the season. That's the small talk question of the season. Count how many times somebody asks you that between now and December 25th. Are you ready for Christmas? I don't know how I'm supposed to answer that. It's like, do you mean that I do all my shopping? I don't do any shopping. I guess Holly's done the shopping as far as I know. There's boxes showing up at the house. I guess we're ready for Christmas, right? Well, ready or not, here it comes in just a few weeks. Um, let's see, all the kids are back there. All right, all the kids are back in Children's Church. So let me ask the adults in the room a question. Just contemplate this yourselves, adults, all right? I want you to think about this. What do you, adults, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? Now, I tell you what, if we went back to Children's Church and just interrupted the lesson, first off, I'd be in trouble. But if we went back and interrupted the lesson and said, hey, kids, what do you want for Christmas? They could rattle off a few things, right? What about you adults? Do you have something on the tip of your tongue that you could say? I mean, it's kind of an absurd question to even ask an adult, right? And the older we get, the more practical we become with our answers. Well, I could use some new socks. Or like our vacuum is kind of old and it's not doing what it used to do. Like it's just a weird question to ask an adult because, again, as we grow up, we become more practical and our wants more gravitate toward what we actually need, right? There's a difference. You don't need me to tell you this. There's a difference between what you want and what you need. The non-essentials and the essentials, there is a difference. Now, when I was a kid, for a few years in a row, one of the things that I wanted for Christmas was a gaming system. And back in my day, we had a little thing called a Sega Genesis. Are you familiar with the Sega Genesis? You'll learn about it in history class, okay? And so for several years in a row, I asked for a Sega Genesis. I did not get it for several years in a row. Now, eventually, I did get a Sega Genesis that I had to share with my brother, which was tough because it came with one controller. What are we doing? Two controllers, minimum, please. I eventually did get it, but just when it was uh, like just about to go out of style, and it was on the cusp of becoming irrelevant, and that's when I got a Sega Genesis. But for several years up to that, I asked for a Sega Genesis. And I remember the first year I asked for it, I remember what my dad said. He said, okay, would you rather have a Sega Genesis or heat in the house during the winter, right? <laughs> now, in my kid brain, I'm thinking, I'd rather have the Sega Genesis, right? <laughs> I could put on a coat, get some fingerless gloves, and we'll have a good time, yeah? But he was trying to make a point, and all you parents in the room get this point, that there is a difference between what you want and what you need. And there's no such thing as infinite money. And if you have to choose between what you want and what you need, you ought to go with what you need, right? Let's go with heat and not the Sega, right? We'll go with heat instead, right? And so we know this, and we grow up, and we realize that there is a difference between what we want and what we need. And if we're asked that question as adults, what do you want for Christmas? It's like, I don't, I don't know. Is there a way that I can ask for just like all my relationships to be good? Is that, a, is that a reasonable request for Christmas? It's not like you can buy that for me, right? What do you want? What do you want for Christmas? Now, here we are in this Christmas season, and we're going through what we're calling the Jesus series. We've been doing this since September, looking at the life of Jesus in a mostly chronological order. And one of the things that we're seeing about the life and the ministry of Jesus is that he comes to this world, and he meets these urgent needs, and he meets people where they are, and he takes care of people. But we also see, if we're going to be honest about it, we're also seeing a pattern in the life of Jesus where he is, and this sounds wild to say, where he is actually disappointing some people as he goes along. Because while Jesus came to this earth to meet our greatest need, he does not come to meet every single one of our wants, desires, and expectations. Now, last Sunday, I very briefly talked about one of the most famous of all of Jesus' miracles, the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, the feeding of the 5,000. We just breezed right by it. For those of you here with us last week, we just whoop, skipped right over that. So we're going to talk about that miracle a little bit more today, and I want you to see what happens just after this miracle is performed. Now, last Sunday, we looked from the Gospel of Matthew. Was it Matthew? I'm pretty sure it was Matthew last week. I'm getting all these confused as we're bouncing around. This week, we're going to look at the same event from the Gospel of John. 
Now, John gives us some details that Matthew doesn't, and Matthew gives us some details that John doesn't, which is one of the reasons why we have four different biographies of the life of Jesus, picking up different details, giving us different perspectives, showing us different dimensions of the ministry of Jesus. And so if you have a Bible with you, or if you want to open up your Bible app, you can look at John chapter 6. If you're using a paper copy of the Bible, it's about yay far back, okay? John chapter 6. And we're going to see the same occasion, the same miracle from John's perspective as told by John. John chapter 6, verse 2. A large crowd followed him, Jesus, because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Now, John doesn't give us the detail that Matthew gives us. That Jesus was going through this thing. He found out about the death of John the Baptist. He was trying to get some alone time. He was trying to get some time with Father God to to pray and be restored. Matthew gives us this detail. And so here's what happens. Even though he was trying to spend that time with Father God, a large crowd follows him. And they believed. Why do they believe? Because they saw what he was doing. He was healing their sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down with his disciples. And we know from Matthew's account that he healed all. All of their sick. And as you go through the Bible, you, you never see Jesus interacting with someone. It's like, you know what? That sickness is just too much for me. No. He has power over all illness. He's capable of healing all illnesses. There's nothing too great for Jesus. So he's healed them. Now the Passover feast, verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. Okay, John is just giving us some timing of where these things are happening. Then Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he intended to do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad, that's a fun word, lad, it's from the New American Standard, There is a lad. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place. And men sat down and numbered about 5,000. So again, 5,000 households. And Jesus took the loaves. And having given thanks, he distributed those who were seated. Likewise, the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Again, a basket full for each disciple. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Now, a couple things about that. Matthew leaves this detail out. But they see this sign. Don't don't forget that. They see this sign, and they arrive at a conclusion about who Jesus is. And what they're doing here is they're really misidentifying who Jesus is. They say, this is not a prophet. They say, this is the prophet. We have seen this sign performed, so this is the prophet. Now, in those days, among the Israelite community, they were waiting for a prophet to come in the spirit of Elijah, A prophet to come and prepare the way for the Messiah. And so they're misidentifying Jesus not as the Messiah, but as the prophet who leads the way for the Messiah. Well, listen, we all have the power of retrospect here, and we have access to the whole Bible. We know what what Jesus says about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the prophet who was to come before the Messiah. And so the people see this sign, and they believe that this is the prophet who has come into the world Verse 15, this is a detail that Matthew does not give us, but it's very important. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. He withdraws, not only because he needed that time with Father God, not only because he was processing the death of John the Baptist, but he knows these people have seen a sign, and he knows their intention to make them their king. We continue on here, moving down to verse 22. The next day, this is, okay, the very next day. The next day, the crowd, the same crowd. The next day, the crowd, and by the way, do you know what I just skipped over? Jesus walking on water. That's pretty fun. Read it for yourself. The next day, 
The crowd stood on the other side of the sea, saw that there was no small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples into the boat, but his disciples had gone away alone. There came another small boat from Tiberias to the place where they had ate bread, and the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, where is this guy? You know, the guy who fed us yesterday? When they saw he was not there, nor his disciples, they got... They themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus doesn't say, oh, yeah, you're confused by the boats and all this. Well, I sent my disciples ahead, and then I walked on the water, and I jumped in the boat. He doesn't give them, I mean, that's the answer to that question. But he does not give them the answer to the question that they're asking. They ask him, when did you get here? Jesus answers a different question. Jesus speaks to their hearts and what they were really wanting and what they were really wondering. Jesus has a habit of doing just this. He knows our motivations. He knows what's going on in the hearts of people. And so they've asked him, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. It's like, I know why you guys are here. You're here for lunch. I know why you guys are here. You want some more free food. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. That's what you're here for, right? You had it yesterday. You want it again today. And he says to them, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, again, a term Jesus uses to describe himself, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him, The Father, God, has set his seal. I know why you're here. You want to eat some physical food. But I'm telling you, you need to focus on. You need to focus on food that will last. Focus on what's going to give you eternal life. And what Jesus is saying is very simple. Yes, you've got this this kind of immediate need. You need to be fed, or at least maybe you want to be fed. You want that right now. You feel like you need that right now. And yes, we do need food to survive. But I'm telling you, what's more important is literal physical bread. What's more important than making sure you're kept alive for today. What's more important is eternal life and securing your eternal destination. That is more important than physical food. Do you disagree? Like if you, if you don't have physical food, eventually you will die. Yeah. And then what? Your eternal destination is more important than just figuring out well, what am I, where's my next meal coming from. Right? And so Jesus says, work for this food that will give you eternal life. And he says, I can give you this food. Therefore, they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Yeah, you're telling us to work for this food that will give us eternal life. All right, well, tell us, what are the works that we must do? <clears throat> to gain this eternal life. And look how Jesus responds. He doesn't say, well, you got to go feed the poor, and you got to do charitable works, and you got to bring in ramen to your worship services, and you have to bring in Christmas gifts for the needy, and you have to do these rituals, and you have to sing songs while Brett sings, and you have to do all these different things, and you have to show up at Bible studies. And if you do all those things, and if you're a really good boy or girl, you can have eternal life. No. Jesus doesn't say this at all. Well, what is the work? What's the work that we must do to gain eternal life? And Jesus answered them and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now, here's our old buddy John here writing this gospel, and he's using this bad grammar in the original Greek, which I don't think any of us speak in this room, right? In the original Greek, this was bad grammar, but John was creating this new idea of putting your belief in someone. Maybe the better translation for us who speak English would be to put your trust in someone. And Jesus is saying the work that you must do isn't work at all. It's belief. It's trust in the one God has sent. And Jesus is, of course, referring to himself. Put your trust in Jesus for eternal life. So they said to him, oh, you guys are going to love this. You guys are going to love this. They said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? Guys, yesterday, do you forget yesterday? Jesus healed all of your sick and he fed 5,000 households. Do you remember that? Well, that was yesterday. 
what can you do today? What sign can you perform for us? Do you realize how often Jesus has asked this question? You know what I'm starting to realize? Is that for some people, there's just never enough signs. And I would go back to the time of Moses. Think about the time of Moses. Some of you are familiar with his life and his journey and his story. And God used this man, Moses, who was just a man, by the way. He wasn't God. He used this man, Moses, to do this incredible work. And Moses went to the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. Does any of this sound familiar? And he says to Pharaoh, you've got to let all of my people, all of the Hebrews, all of the Israelites, you have to let them all go. They're slaves. You've got to make them free. Pharaoh says no, and God sends these miraculous plagues one after the other, and then Moses leads all of the the entire nation of the Israelites. He leads them all out of slavery through the Red Sea, and the seas are parted. Do you remember this? To the other side, and then the seas close up over Pharaoh's army who's chasing after him. And then what happens? He leads them out. They've got their freedom. He goes up to a mountain to receive the commandments from God. And the people down below say, well, we don't know what even happened to this guy. Maybe we should worship somebody else. Maybe we should worship like a calf. What happened to this Moses fellow? Have you forgotten what happened? Have you forgotten the signs and the miracles that you've been through? Guys, this is us. This is how we are. This is the attitude we have. Well, what have you done for me lately? Yeah? Parents, don't you get this from your children? Right? My youngest, wow, she keeps track of what nights we had dessert and what nights we don't. (laughs) Can we have ice cream tonight? Well, we didn't have it last night. We didn't have it the night before that. And, And two nights ago, you said that we'd have it later. How are you keeping all this stuff in your brain? What have you done for me lately, Dad? Where's the dessert? But this is how people are. We forget so easily. But in this case, it's more than just forgetting. (laughs) In this case, they're trying to bait Jesus, tempt him into doing a miracle for them. What do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers, I mean, this is just off the top of my head, Jesus. Our fathers, uh, they ate manna in the wilderness. You know, they got bread. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And this was during the time of Moses. The people were hungry, and God gave them food to eat. Moses prayed, and God gave them food to eat. This manna collected on the ground, this bread from heaven. That's what it was. So, you know, Jesus, we were just thinking that Moses did this thing with bread. You did bread yesterday. Maybe you could do some more bread today. Would that be great? Right? They're trying to bait him into doing this miracle. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father. It's my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Are you ready for this? Jesus is about to tiptoe into this idea. And it gets a little bit weird, and it gets a little bit complex, but Jesus starts to refer to himself as this bread from heaven. Bread, physical bread, literal bread, sustains our lives, right? Unless you have a gluten allergy and you find something else to eat. But you know what I mean. Food, literal food, sustains life. And Jesus is beginning to introduce this idea. He's like, no, I'm what you need to sustain life. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven, this is Jesus, and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am. I am. One of the earliest titles for God. When Moses first first meets God as a burning bush, he says, well, what's your name, God? Who do I tell the people that you are? And he says, I am. Jesus here says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That all that he has given me, I lose nothing. But raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. 
and I will myself will raise him up on the last day. Again, Jesus is speaking about this last day. It's time when this old world, as we know it, it's the last day of this old world. It will be this time of resurrection. And Jesus says, everyone who believes and puts their trust in Jesus will be brought back, will be raised up on that last day. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him. I mean, not only did this guy say, no, I'm not going to feed you. Now he's referring to himself as the bread from heaven. Now he's saying that he came down from heaven, all right? Nobody likes being told no, right? Just ask Alana, can we have ice cream tonight? No, she doesn't like it. Nobody likes being told no. But in addition to being told no, I'm not going to feed you today. That was yesterday. I'm not going to do that for you. I know that's what you want from me, but I'm not going to do that. Now they're told something else. Jesus says, I'm the bread from heaven. I came down from heaven. And they grumble about him because he said that I'm the bread that came down from heaven. <clears throat> they were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Now let's give these people a little bit of grace and understanding here. As far as they knew, he was just Joseph's kid. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Who does this guy think he is? Going around telling people he came down from heaven? I mean, we appreciate you feeding us yesterday, but are you kidding me? You out of your mind? Came down from heaven, you're Joe's kid. They didn't know. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, this is one of these somewhat challenging, but I also find this verse encouraging. It's a challenging verse, but it's an encouraging verse. Just this idea that no one comes to believe in Jesus except by the will of the Father. Which means for us, those of us who are Christians, those of us who believe in Jesus, those of us who perceive Jesus as our Savior, that it is our obligation, our responsibility, and our delight to be able to tell people about Jesus. But we don't have the power to manipulate or to force someone into receiving Jesus as their Savior. We just speak the words and sow the seeds. The Father God has to draw the person to the Son. That's how it's been always and will always be that way. That takes the burden off of our shoulders and puts it squarely on the shoulders of God. We just do the talking. We do the communicating. We do the loving. We do the caring. God has to draw the person to Jesus. Verse 45, it is written the prophets. Jesus is continuing to speak here. And they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father. Except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. He's, again, Jesus is talking about himself. He's the one who's come from the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. He does not back down. He knows that this statement offended them and confused them, but he's saying it again. In case you didn't hear me, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. It's just physical food. It's just temporary food. It can only sustain you for a little while. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. Now, at this point, if you're one of the 12 disciples, you might be tempted to tug Jesus on the robe and say, Hey, Jesus, um... Maybe you want to back off all this bread stuff because <laughs> you're starting to lose the crowd here. I'm hearing the grumbling increase. They're not with you, Jesus. Maybe transition onto something else. But he keeps on going with this. On the living bread that came down from heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Oh, boy. Again, Jesus is he's hitting the gas here. He's really leaning into this. He's trying to teach them something. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is ridiculous. I mean, for just a moment, put yourself in that original crowd as they're listening to this. Like, what are you talking about? You want us to, did I hear you? Do you want us to consume your flesh? Am I hearing you correctly? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks 
my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. All right, Jesus, that's enough of all this flesh and blood stuff. No, he keeps going. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, those of us sitting in this room right now, we have the power of retrospect. I said that earlier. We can see from, from this future vantage point what happened back then and what Jesus was trying to say. You know, we know what takes place during the Last Supper. We know that Jesus talks about giving up his body and sacrificing his flesh and shedding his blood for us. And really, quite literally, what Jesus is saying is he's about to give up his flesh, his body, so that we can live. And he will shed his blood so that we can live. And Jesus suffers that punishment. What does John call him? He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And this innocent Lamb, Jesus, will be slain. His flesh will be killed. His blood will be spilled for us. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So see, he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats of this bread will live forever. And you have to keep in mind, Jesus is meeting these people where they are. You want physical bread? All right, let's keep talking about, about bread. Let's keep talking about what you need. You need me. And here's the main bullet point of what Jesus is saying. You need me more than you need fish and bread. He says, I'm the bread of life. I am what gives you life. How did this go over? I want to jump down to verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew. And were not walking with him anymore. That's sad. But that's real. We wanted something to eat. You gave us a sermon that we couldn't even understand. We were hungry. You didn't give us anything to eat. You said you preached at us, talking about eternal life, and you are the bread of life, and we need to believe in you. But you wouldn't feed us. And we know that you can, but you refuse to do it. I'm out of here. And so many of his disciples left. And so Jesus, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> turns to the 12. Jesus said to the 12, you do, not want to want to, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Jesus, where are we going to go? <laughs> we may not understand everything that you're saying, but where else will we go? You're speaking the words of life. Your words are life. There is a difference, friends. There is a difference between what you want and what you need. There is a difference between what we, we might want from Jesus and what we really need from Jesus. We bring Jesus our prayer requests. We ask him to heal the sick. We ask him to take care of our immediate needs here on this planet Earth. And we have full permission to do so. And Jesus... Sometimes he gives us exactly what we want. Sometimes our prayer requests are answered just the way we want them to. And sometimes they aren't. You need to know this about Jesus. This little baby born in a manger, right? The humble beginnings, something about Jesus. He didn't come to this earth to give us what we want. He came into this world to give us what we need. Now let's think about this. What is the one thing you need more than anything else? Let's move beyond a Sega Genesis, beyond just food for today. What is the one thing you need more than anything else? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to answer that question. Maybe your answer is the same. I'm a guy who believes in the Bible. All right, That might not surprise you, given the context here. I'm somebody who believes that this is the Word of God revealed, and this book speaks the truth. And what this book tells me about me is that I am a sinner. And what this book tells me about me is that, yeah, I can do good works, and I can share love with people, and I can be kind to people, 
I mean, sometimes I can be kind to people and generous, and I can show up at church services, and I can preach sermons, and I can go to Bible studies, and I can go on mission trips, and I can do all these things, and I can do all these things for my entire life, but I will never do enough good to earn myself entrance, acceptance into heaven. That's what I know about me. I am powerless. I cannot escape damnation. I can't. I deserve damnation. That's what I believe about me based on what I read in this book. And so what do I need <laughs> more than anything else? What do I need? I need someone to bail me out. I can't bail myself out. I need somebody to pay off my debt so I don't go to hell and instead go to heaven. I need a, uh, oh, what's it called? Savior, that's it. I need a Savior more than anything else. Well, I have one. <laughs> God himself intervened on my behalf. He paid off my debt. Jesus paid off the debt that I owed to God. He suffered on the cross the penalty that I should have suffered. He rose again, and I have put my trust, huh, not in me. I don't trust in Josh Schaefer. I trust in Jesus Christ for my salvation. And the good news is that Jesus did all of this not just for me, but he did it for you too. Not just for you, but for everybody that you know and for all of humankind. Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He has met our most vital essential need, the need for a Savior. That's what Jesus has given to us, has offered to us salvation. Not that we've earned, but that he's given to us. So my question for you is, have you received that gift? Have you transferred your trust off of yourself and on to Jesus? Have you believed that Jesus is the Son of God? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. That's what Scripture tells us. And so have you received Jesus as your Savior. There are people in this room, probably a high percentage, again, given the context, a high percentage of you that would answer that question, yeah, yes, I have received Jesus as my Savior. Thank God. That's wonderful news. That's wonderful to hear. That's wonderful to know. What about everybody else that you know? What about everybody else that you love? Have they received Jesus as their Savior? Have they had their most important need met Yet, if not, you've got work to do. If not, you've got some work to do. I know we talk about this as a lot, a lot as a church, but we're going to keep talking about it, right? And so if you're sick of all this evangelism stuff, you know, you're going to have to start doing it or maybe leave the church, one or the other. I don't know. We'll see what happens, yeah? But if you've got people in your life that don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have the opportunity to tell them about Jesus, to introduce them to Jesus, to unpack the gospel for them, to tell them what you believe about Jesus, to share Jesus with them in some way. Well, how can you do that? Well, this whole sermon that I'm giving right now, it's available online. You can, you can watch it as a video. You can listen to it as a podcast. And if anything I've said this morning might be helpful to somebody in your life, send it to them if it might be helpful in helping them understand the gospel. But if not, don't, Okay. <laughs> You know your people, you know who your loved ones, you know where they are, you know where they are in their hearts and what they believe and where they're struggling. But you can send this content to them if it's helpful. You can also invite those people in your life who don't yet know Jesus as their Savior to worship next Sunday. It's the perfect time of year. People are more inclined to say yes during Christmas and Easter. It's Christmas season. Let's take full advantage of it. So I'm glad that those of you who have received Christ as your Savior, that's such a relief, that's so wonderful, but now... Now, for those of us who have received Christ this evening, now it's our job to share Jesus with the other people in our lives. So I'll ask the question again. Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Have you received the gift of salvation and eternal life? And if your answer is no, I want to let you know that you can receive that gift right now. I mean, some people spend a lot of time doing church stuff, doing like Bible study stuff, and doing good works and small groups, but they never actually say yes to Jesus. They never transfer trust off of themselves 
and on to Jesus. So if you're someone who has never received Jesus as your Savior, the good news is you can do it right now. Listen, there's no magic ritual. There's no magic words that need to be spoken. You just take your trust and you put it, did you, what, is, what did it say, Romans 10, 9? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's not overcomplicate it. And so what we're going to do as we close out our worship service today, if you have not received Christ as your Savior, you can do so during our prayer time. Again, I cannot stress this enough. There's no magic ritual. There's no magic set of words that make this happen. This is an expression, a, com a communication, a prayer between you and God where you accept the gift that Jesus has given to you. And so as we close our worship service today, I want to invite you to join me. You can stay seated. I want to invite you to join me in this time of prayer. Father God, we acknowledge that in Jesus Christ you have done for us what we could not do for ourselves. You have extended to us this gift. And Father God, we know that this gift was very expensive. It cost you the life of your one and only Son. And Jesus, we know this gift was very expensive. It cost you your flesh and your blood. Jesus, I thank you for the people in my life who introduced me to you, who shared the truth of the gospel with me. And Jesus, I have taken that trust off of myself and I've placed it on you. I thank you for what you've done for me. And I have received eternal life and salvation and forgiveness of sins in you, Jesus. And so many people, God, in this room right now have done the same thing, have placed their trust in you, Jesus. But there are some here this morning some hearing these words right now who have not yet said yes to you. Father God, we create this time and space right now for those who are new to you to say yes to you, Jesus. God, we know it's not a magic ritual. There's no special words. It's just that acknowledgement that we believe. We are putting our belief in you, Jesus. Father God, no one in this room, we're not claiming to have all the answers. We don't have you all figured out. We don't have the Bible all figured out. We don't have Christianity all figured out. We still have plenty of questions, but one thing that we know is that you, Jesus, are the Son of God. You died on the cross for our sins. You rose from the grave. And so we place our trust in you, Jesus. And we take this first step forward in our journey with you, Jesus.